The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this third webinar, which is part of the series of the ICHEMI Centenary Celebrations, the ChemEng Evolution. Our topic today is chemical engineering's role in supporting society expectations, our never-ending challenge. And I'm your moderator for the webinar today. My name is Marlene Kanga. I am a chemical engineer, uh, a past president of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, and passionate about uh, the role of engineering on society and especially on our future. Uh, the working title for today's webinar was what can chemical engineers do about potential future tra trajectories of society and consider how the work of the chemical engineering profession may be tasked to add uh, value to the, our possible futures and perhaps also to address our global challenges. And the context for this discussion is that without question, chemical engineers have played a central role in enabling the high standards of living from the development of abundant and affordable energy, mainly from oil and, and coal sources, new materials, improving access to clean water, facilitating intensive agriculture, the production of bulk pharmaceuticals. However, not everyone has benefited just under 1 billion people are suffering from energy poverty with millions without access to clean water, sanitation, nutrition, or basic medicines. Some of these challenges cannot be solved with technology alone. A cultural shift in the way we think, our expectations, and the dynamics of business and government also need to change. Engineers need not only to just innovate, and develop the technologies demanded to face these global challenges, but also consider the strategies to shift the significant resistance from incumbent systems and the established political, cultural, and institutional barriers to change. So to address these wicked problems, we have a very interesting panel today. Uh, we First off, we have three students from the Liveris Academy of Leadership at the University of Queensland who will give us their thoughts uh, on, on the issues facing chemical engineers and how they might be addressed. Uh, first up, we have Lily Van Gilst, who is completing a dual Bachelor of Engineering and Arts, majoring in Chemical Engineering and International uh, Relations. This eclectic mix of subjects is reflective of Lily's broad interests and her goals for a truly interdisciplinary career. Lily is interested not only in the role of engineering as a future of sustainability, but also the role of chemical engineering in relation to energy. She plans to study nuclear in, in, in engineering, and her ultimate goal is to understand, enhance understanding across the public, private, and political interface regarding necessary actions and measures for the energy transition. Victoria Barnes will be our second speaker from the group. She is currently undertaking an integrated Bachelor and Master of Engineering, ma majoring in Chemical and Environmental Engineering. After relocating from Mississippi, USA to Noosa, Queensland at the end of year 10, she's graduated at the Ducks of her school and uh, has had leadership roles there. In high school, Victoria discovered a passion for using chemistry to solve real world problems and knew that she wanted to use her skills to invent new ways to limit the waste that ends up in our environment. She believes that chemical engineers are going to be exceedingly important change makers for creating a more sustainable world and tackling the global climate change challenges. And finally, we have Kyle Steensma who is currently studying a Bachelor of Engineering uh, and Master of Engineering at UQ in Chemical Engineering. Kyle graduated from Mansfield State High School in 2017 with an OP4, but he didn't know what he wanted to do in life, and so embarked on a year of gap travel. And what uh, resulted was a deep understanding of some of the issues that the world is facing. He has a deep love of humanity, 
and a commitment to tackling the biggest societal problems. Upon commencing his studies at the University of Queensland and throwing himself into clubs and societies, he's become a full-fledged humanitarian, working in Cambodia and soon the Torres Strait Islands to aid disadvantaged communities. He's passionate about education and has created a YouTube channel to better describe society's wicked problems and empower the general public to choose better solutions. So I'm really looking forward to hear the perspectives of the three students from the University of Queensland. So Lily, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, very grateful to be here today. Uh, when I first chose to study chemical engineering, I wasn't actually 100% sure like, what that actually meant. What does a chemical engineer do? What even is a chemical engineer and how do they do it? Um, I knew as all of you would that it had something to do with chemicals and something to do with processes and something to do with solving problems. But now that I'm four years into my chemical engineering degree, I'm extremely proud to say that I still don't have a concrete answer for those questions. And that's part of why um, chemical engineering is so exciting and so important. Um, if you let it, the practice evolves at the same rate as our rapidly changing world, or perhaps even faster if you're looking ahead and preempting what's coming. I say that we actually grow more and more mystified about the scope of chemical engineering each day that we hear of new concepts being explored by amazing chemical engineers, from new frontiers down to the very niches that we've never heard. I think it's only natural for us as chemical engineers to be really fascinated and motivated by some of the most complex problems that face the world today. These are things like, how do we make sure that everyone has access to nutritional food? Or how can we better ensure healthcare for all across the globe and more appropriate housing solutions? Or how do we sustainably power the high quality of life that everyone ultimately desires? Or how do we utilize, recycle, and even restore the land and resources we have available? How can we ensure that when someone picks up the items they use each day from their iPhone to their rice cooker, that these were ethically sourced and produced at every step of the supply chain? These are really enormous challenges and ones that chemical engineers can play a vital role in solving, but there is no way we have the knowledge to do that alone. And that's where the full value of chemical engineering can be realized, in my opinion. Not in the specificities of the concepts that we learn, but in the way that we can communicate and package our knowledge for use towards something more. At the nexus of research and public perception, governments, businesses, economics and ethics, there can be us engineers with the right toolbox to really make an impact. I think if chemical engineers can really apply the right core skills and values to every area they work, there is a real sense of pride in what it means to do so. Firstly, I believe it's important to constantly seek learning in an open way. So challenging the status quo if something doesn't seem right, but also challenging your own thinking when you're faced with new information. Being transparent and unafraid to change your own opinion as well. I've noticed from having a bit of work experience in chemical engineering roles already, that some colleagues can get quite disheartened with the management systems around them and will actively state, like, don't bother, things are never gonna change, we don't need to look forward or really be looking at new technologies. But there are definitely those colleagues that adopt the opposite attitude um, and seek that seat at the table and from my observations, those seem to be the ones who end up in the position to actually make a difference. Um, a part of this is knowing how to be a good leader. And I think we learn a lot about, you know, what makes a good leader, good leadership qualities, but also it's really important to be a good follower, um, lifting up the platform of those who are already making leeway with the things that you value. If there truly is no room to move, I think that we should be aimed to be picky with seeking out employers and roles that align with our beliefs and values as chemical engineers. The second element, which ties in very strongly with that, is the ability to communicate, be it in written form, through speech or visually, 
distilling your often complex knowledge about lots of different things into digestible parcels is really the hallmark of true understanding. Um, being able to utilise technology to communicate through data sets is an area where I'm sure growth is bound to be quite unlimited into the future, be it for your own comprehensive comprehension via real-time digital twinning or for communication with others using visualisations of a phenomena. The, that ability to span across disciplines and age groups and interests is vital whether you find yourself in a lab or holding political office and anywhere in between. After you've listened and learned about what drives the people you're surrounded by, communicating your vision in a way that resonates is really vital and a lot easier. And as much as I really love chemical engineers, it's not enough to just be one, in my opinion. Interaction and collaboration with people from all walks of life and all disciplines is the way to create truly impactful solutions. I think our engineering teams will continue to become more and more diverse and more internationally spanning as we try to address these really complex issues that are facing our world. Our teams need to be aware of economics and geopolitics and go to the source of information. Um, and that experience of connecting with humanity down at the very level of those who you're de designing for and also with those who you're designing with can really drive change that's actually impactful and it's actually making a difference. And I know all of this might seem quite high level, maybe a little bit obvious, um, but Tori and Kyle are gonna take a deeper dive into some of these areas. Uh, as much as I think that these things are quite easy to say, they're generally quite challenging to actually do in our everyday lives. And I think it's important to keep them in the back of our mind, um, underpinning all of our work as we move towards a better future. Thanks, that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Lily, for those uh, very insightful comments. So I'll hand over now to Victoria. Go ahead, Victoria. Thanks, Lily and Marlene. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about what I see our cities looking like in the next 100 years. So obviously, we're celebrating 100 years of ICME. What do we think it's going to look like in another 100 years? What will our cities be like? What will our buildings be like? And what will our infrastructure really have to um, implement in order to be the sustainable world that we need? So as the population of the world is expanding, we quickly approach, um, encroach upon our natural habitats and more and more rapidly. The territorial takeover is seeing approximately 1 million species uh, threatened with extinction worldwide. And this report, um, there was, this was led out by a report by the Intergovernmental Science Policy um, Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And this report mentions that the number one driver of declining biodiversity is changes in land and sea use. And number three, climate change. So the impact on the Earth's ecosystem is not going to be without its ramifications, as I'll discuss later. And steps need to be taken now to improve the way that we coexist with nature. So one possible way that chemical engineers could be influential in developing this over the next 100 years is by making the unused and currently uninhabited areas livable. This could include expanding into oceans and other water bodies where it's environmentally safe to do so, or rehabilitating discarded pieces of land or buildings that are not being properly utilized. Or thinking futuristically, what if we could make the middle of Australia livable? There's certainly plenty of solar power out there. And there's also a whole host of other complex problems um, that we need to solve first. Like where would you get your water from? Where would you, how would you deal with the heat? How do you not disrupt the minimal but still present natural ecosystems that exist in the harshest region of Australia? And I'm sure there's other areas around the world where this is the same case. But what if instead of looking for ways to stop our emissions going out into the atmosphere, we looked for ways to bring it in? Imagine if your house could absorb the same, same amount of CO2 as a forest. In 100 years, carbon intensive materials will be a thing of the past. We already have carbon negative materials, which hold onto more carbon than is released during their manufacturing. But in the coming decades, I believe that chemical engineers are gonna be a big part of altering the carbon balance even further so that we can use materials to decrease the CO2 currently in the atmosphere. 
One such example of a material that is already a trailblazer in this ball game is olivine sand. Um, you can see a little photo of it there on the PowerPoint. Um, this is can absorb up to its own mass in CO2 and is a great substitute for traditional sand or in fertilizer. And it comprises 60 to 80 percent of the Earth's upper mantle, making it one of the most common minerals on the Earth. There are some challenges with its quick weathering rate and more problem solving must be completed before large scale implementation, but it is a good start in a direction our material usage needs to head. Other areas that I see chemical engineers being key players in is making more products from waste to create a more circular um, economy. For example, with the development of 3D printing comes the ability to turn otherwise useless construction waste like sawdust and lignin into new 3D printed wooden materials or like turning CO2 into carbonate materials for use in bricks and other building materials. So in 2022, or sorry, in 2020, space conditioning or heating and cooling accounted for 41% of the major electricity and uses in Australia. Um, this is according to a governmental energy use report. One way to limit the energy demands of a building is to implement thermal regulation. Um, this includes making the most of the weather, for example, opening windows at optimum angles uh, for the sun's position and ambient temperature, and optimizing use of the uh, building's thermal mass. Thermal regulation causes a positive feedback loop with CO2 emissions. As more space conditioning is used, um, more greenhouse gases are emitted, and then even more cooling and heating are needed to counteract the extreme temperature fluctuations because of the impact on the atmosphere and climate change. So implementing natural thermal performance is not only an initial priority, but it also um, lowers running costs and can help mitigate this loop that we are engaged in with emissions from thermal regulation. Good thermal regulation starts with optimizing buildings for their location in the region that it's in. This is where chemical engineers can come in with their knowledge of environmental systems and the materials needed for the best thermal efficiency. Insulation is also a key factor in thermal regulation, but isn't always the most environmentally friendly. Um, but materials like mycelium, mycelium are helping to change that. Mycelium comes from fungi, is fast growing and naturally fire retardant, making it a great insulator. It has also been used for other products such as packaging, coffins and leather products. Water load on buildings is another area that could use the magical touch of a chemical engineer. A water smart building would ideally not need to bring in or dispose of any water used for common processes such as hand washing, flushing toilets and landscaping. Imagine if we could fully close the water cycle within a building while still maintaining hygiene and safety. I believe chemical engineers can make this happen. Unfortunately, we are past the point of being able to completely avoid all of the backlash that human activities have had on the earth. In fact, we've witnessed many of these recently from ravaging bushfires to major floods and other catastrophic natural disasters. It's also reasonable to expect that if we keep pushing our cities and suburbia further into natural ecosystems, we will be met with increased diseases and diversity impacts. My generation is now tasked with reversing the damage to the planet resulting from human actions over the past several centuries since the Industrial Revolution when coal became a large part of our lives. A two-pronged approach will be needed moving forward. We cannot immediately reverse 200 years of CO2 emissions in a decade, so we'll need to make changes as well as implement prevention measures simultaneously. This will require innovation from the best problem solvers to determine the most efficient and adaptable measures to protect society. So now we know the facts and have some solutions, but now it's time to translate them into law. We need strong policy and position now and in the coming decades that will place a proper value on our planet and natural ecosystems. Biodiversity, clean air, pure water, they all have monetary, social, and psychological value to the world. Yet we do not often properly value the projects that impact our surrounding ecosystems. In some sectors, it's starting to happen. But in 100 years, I want to see environmental value as a top consideration in any infrastructure or city planning project. Solving worldwide problems is great and all, but without the proper policy and implementation in place, it's useless. Unfortunately, we don't currently see many chemical engineers in policymaking. However, I think engineers are perfect for these roles. We practically live and breathe group work, are trained in delivering project timelines and doing problem solving on the fly. These are all very important skills needed not only for the crucial decision making, but also for delivering decisions efficiently and with a thought out plan for implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria, for those thoughts. Uh, very, very interesting.
And so now I'll pass on to Kyle, who's waiting to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Hello. So, yes, I will be talking about getting involved in public discourse. And you can see I've written here the real public discourse. And by that, I mean, you know, the conversations that are heard by every voting citizen. Um, like, these conversations that propagate through an entire society rather than just one discipline or one kind of area of people. And I think I'll start off in this by saying, you know, when it comes to decarbonisation, nobody has any idea of the quantities at play. Um, and to elaborate on this a little bit more, um, I was seeing a lecture earlier this week listening about hydrogen. And what they reckon in Australia is if we tried to decarbonize our current hydrogen production uh, by making it all green, produced by renewable electricity, we would need 13 times our maximum peak electricity demands today, 24 hours a day or a year. That's no reduction in transport, no reduction in steel or stationary energy or export emissions. None of that, just a small reduction in emissions from industry. And that just blows my mind. And I, I've heard figures thrown around of, you know, like a ballpark estimate of decarbonizing our entire society, including domestic and emissions, of something like 80 times our grid capacity of electricity if we want to go fully renewable, fully green. Um, and if, if we try to do that in line with, you know, the latest net zero target in the world, which is 2070 in India, we'd have to deploy renewable energy infrastructure 30 times faster than our record breaking years in 2019, like 2021, every single year from now until 2070. Can, like, I just can't imagine saying that to someone. Like, it, it kind of broke my mind when I first heard it as well. Like, you thought 21 projects in one year across Australia was good. Try 630 every year for 50 years straight. Um, I feel like the quantities at play, like, because nobody, in, because it's such a public debate. Um, everybody is getting involved, but nobody is really equipped to know what magnitudes are like are required. Um, and and it's like yes, those figures that I put out, you know, they'll definitely get lower. The requirements will get lower because we will make amazing progress in technology, efficiency, infrastructure, and stuff like that. But like, how fast will that happen? And I think because this kind of stuff isn't communicated through the rest of society and, and all the way up to decision makers, I think. A lot of people feel like they can just pick and choose, right? Like all this debate gets us nowhere because if someone says we need this technology and the other person says no, we don't, those two statements are completely equal and there's no um, no numbers involved. And they think they can pick and choose. Like 50% um, of Australian citizens right now refuse to even consider nuclear. And there's other technologies that everyone just feels like, oh no, we don't. Or, no, we don't need it to really think about. We don't know, like the sound of it. Um, and I think. That just feels like the biggest risk to me, like decreasing the scope or the availability of the, the things that we can even think about to try and solve such a massive problem, I think is really weighing us down. And I think engineers in general, but especially chemical, because we are involved in almost literally every aspect and source of emissions, have the imperative to bring these quantities and what our technical capabilities and what, what the road ahead looks like when we make big goals like this, um, we need to bring that into the public discourse and educate people around stuff like this because I feel like it is it can be quite harmful if society is left to just speculation. Um, and so by doing this, I think like, you know, like why, why even should we do this? Just a quick question, I think in principle, because issues like this affect literally everyone in society. Um, it's I, like almost our our responsibility, I think, to, to inform them on stuff like this. If, it's, if it affects someone and they want to make a decision about it, I think they should, but they should also be able to make an informed decision and to have as many facts as possible. And I think that is such a, a bottleneck that exists currently. And in, pra in practice, I think our in industries are ultimately governed by the public in any way. So um, social, social license to operate is becoming huge now, but also the fact that um, no um, politician is going to be taken seriously if they say we should legalize nuclear in this country. 51% of the population says we shouldn't, right? That's just um, ridiculous. If only like 20% as well are the only ones who actually think that we should. Um, and so ultimately when there's less information, people can't make informed decisions and industry is limited by that through the full cycle. 
um, when we go to attempt this kind of stuff, you know, we have to communicate very, very tricky topics. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we don't do such a good job or we don't attempt as much now. Um, you know, like trying to communicate the magnitude of the challenge without um, freaking people out or by saying, hey, this is just a magnitude, not an exact number, right? We don't, we, there's no way we can talk and that's on uncertainty. Being able to communicate uncertainty is still something we're trying to figure out and it's something that climate change in particular has suffered immensely um, throughout history. And I think rates of progress is something as well. Um, even like that's still something that we can't figure out. Everything is taken tainted by uncertainty, but you know, how do we talk about how fast we think we can progress in this research um, and, and cost reductions and stuff like this. Talking about risk, especially um, as I was talking about nuclear before, you know, comparing the different types of risk and being able to communicate that they're not necessarily more risky or less risky, or, um, or like talking about the difference between hydrogen and petrol, right? There's different risks, but it's not necessarily more risky. And we need to be able to convey that to have people understand it. And in complex systems, of course, you know, um, you know the, the balancing of the electricity grid, stuff like this, um, is, is quite important to the debate, and yet nobody really gets involved in it outside of engineering circles. Um, and so what would it really look like if we were able to do this um, and able to try and kind of to be more involved in this discourse? Like, what would it look like to break out, I think? You know, you'd see academics escaping the research echo chamber. I've you know, been to multiple conferences of research conferences, and it's just academics who are there, and it's just the academics sharing research with each other, which of course is amazing, it's great for the research sector, but no, like, nobody, like, maybe like my mom, who's a primary school teacher, who still has the right to vote on policy or any stuff, isn't seeing that because there's no way she even knows that exists. Um, and industry, you know, embracing open source, uh, building it public, I think this is stuff that, like, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, and some of the people who are really just trying to start out businesses are, in the entrepreneurial sector, embracing this kind of mindset, I think it would be amazing um, if industry was able to kind of let go a little bit of this, this purely competition mindset um, and to realize that this is the kind of, you know, community um, progress that, that we need uh, and to spread this information. And so, like, I want you to, like, to just, like, leave my speech on, um, you know, trying to imagine a society that is dedicated to public understanding. A true, true understanding uh, in everybody in society, not just teachers, not just, you know, uh, people who have the obligation, uh, like written down by law or something like that. But, you know, for everyone who's doing something to, to really be dedicated to making everyone understand what it might affect them. Um, you know, imagine a generation of engineering and communication graduates that like are also dedicated to making these topics approachable, understandable and engaging. A lot of people go into engineering just because they, they like numbers or they like to deal with this stuff um, and not deal with people. And it's totally fair. I think that's fine for people who want to do that. But we also need um, people who are willing and, and really um, people oriented to be able to do this stuff. And I think maybe seeing those types of degrees exist uh, and become more common would be a step in the right direction. And I think imagine education campaigns, you know, regular debate and discussion grounded in facts and quantities to make people really understand, like being on TV, radio programs quite frequently. Um, and, you know, like maybe that does exist now, but it's not in the way that I'm really talking about here. In public expos, um, you know, there's already, there's expos that exist around the current state of tech, but that's really just for business, um, for industry members to come and you know, exchange details. It's not for people who are just, you know, waltzing through Brisbane City one day and see this and be like, hey, you know, what's the status of the latest wind turbine or what's, how expensive is hydrogen these days and just have to walk around and, and to be educated and to see a holistic picture as well. Uh, even indulging in, in some memes, going into uh, social media and, and being able to actually engage with the people, uh, or with the way that people discuss these, these topics, because whether you like it or not, with, People in society talking about this on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so those are the platforms that, you know, industry and, and chemical engineers may need to figure out a way to tap into to make sure that um, that the real public discourse is is factual and, and is aware of the challenges and the commitments that we're talking about making.
Um, and so with that, I will end my speech for today. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Carl, uh, and, and thank you to all three of you. It was a great uh, uh, sequence of uh, presentations from the issues from Lily, some of the technologies that we could look at, at in the here and now, uh, from Victoria and Carl, your very thought-provoking uh, commentary on policy, politics, and communication. And in fact, this is a great segue to uh, introducing Professor Genevieve Bell, our next speaker, who has uh, who has uh, made this an art form, if I might say. Uh, Genevieve is a distinguished professor, uh, director of the 3A Institute and Florence Violet McKenzie Chair at the Australian National University and Vice President and Senior Fellow at Intel. We're really delighted and honoured to have you here, Genevieve. Uh, Genevieve completed her PhD in Cultural Anthropology at Stanford University and is best known for her work at the intersection of cultural practice and technology development. And she is an influential voice with academia, industry and government. She's a non-executive director of Commonwealth Bank of Australia, uh, which is one of Australia's uh, largest banks. Uh, uh, a a member of the Australian Prime Minister's National Science and Technology Council, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and in 2020 was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome you, Genevieve, uh, to this discussion. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. And I really didn't want to take terribly much time because I'm sure there are lots of questions and I want to think about how to thread through and be really respectful of Lily and Kyle and Victoria and all of that incredible enthusiasm. Uh, so that's a long set of things to hear about me. Really the only important pieces are the following. Uh, I have a single guiding principle to the decisions I make in my life. Uh, when I was a much younger person, my mother sat my brother and I down and explained to us that you had a moral obligation to make the world a better place a moral obligation through your intellectual labor, but also through the way you spent your time and your energy and the decisions and choices you made in your life. And she was very clear that it shouldn't just be better for you, it should be better for the people who couldn't necessarily find themselves into the places where decisions are being made. So Kyle, I totally hear you with the notion that it's about where do we have the conversations and who's in the conversations. And I think it's equally about who doesn't find their way into the room and how do we make sure we either create room for them to be in that room or that we are being as mindful as we can about the multiplicity of voices that don't always find their way into a conversation and not to frame them in the language of uh, disadvantage but in the language of what other knowledge sets they bring to bear that we might want to be able to utilize and build on right so you know sort of injunction number one was that there's a moral obligation right and the moral obligation is that the world should be better when you are done and for me, better has always been three really clear things, right? It should be more fair, it should be more just, and it should be more sustainable. And I think, you know, those three pieces are surprisingly hard to accomplish most of the time. And trying to work out how not to have trade-offs between them is always an interesting and exquisitely messy problem. Uh, second thing you need to know about me, so um, Elena is right, my background is in cultural anthropology, which always makes me a weird choice in places like this. It's like, oh, chemical engineers, you are also my people. Because in addition to having been you know, told as a child you had a moral obligation to change the world, I have spent the last 30 years of my professional life at this point in and out of organisations run by engineers and computer scientists. And part of the reason my jobs have ended up in those places was that I was really clear that if you wanted to make a change in the world that was meaningful, you needed to find a way to do it at scale. And whilst I have loved being an academic in both my much earlier life and my current instantiation, I was pretty clear that the places that were making the future 25 years ago were large tech companies. And so I figured if you wanted to be somewhere where you were going to have an impact at scale, it was a technology company. And so I joined Intel Corporation back in the 1990s uh, as an anthropologist, which was deeply mysterious to them. Uh, I found them also deeply mysterious. <laughs> I <laughs> spent a lot of time explaining that anthropology was not about monkeys or pyramids or ants, which had that occasionally, uh, but that in fact I was interested in people and the ways in which what motivated people, what frustrated them, what they wanted for themselves, their families, their kids, their communities, their countries, their cultures, their environments, those things should inspire and drive technology process and development. And so my job at Intel really was to haunt the place with stories of human beings and of the things they cared about. 
and of arguing that those weren't just marketing concerns, right? Those were foundational concerns around which you should design new technological systems. And oh, by the way, those technical systems also had to find a way to sit inside people's lives. And it wasn't enough to say, oh, they'll work it out or they just don't understand it. <laughs> they actually had to start with the things that they cared about. And so I have made my life sitting inside large tech companies, uh, always sort of trying to explain what it is that humans care about and sometimes talking about the non-human too, right? That it wasn't just about people, it was the places those people found and made meaning in their lives. Which means over the last five years, I've come out of a full-time job in the technology world and moved to Australia, which is clearly where I'm from, but not where I've spent a lot of time of late. And when I came home, I did it with one devastatingly simple and stupidly ambitious mission, which was to establish a new branch of engineering to take AI safely, responsibly, and sustainably to scale. Because I looked around uh, at the places I think where Lily and Kyle and Victoria have been and are going, and I thought to myself, hmm, <laughs> there is this large new technology or constellation of technologies uh, on the horizon, and they require more than we have. They require a different set of conversations and a different set of practitioners and a different set of practices. And I've been studying and studying with engineers and computer scientists for a long time. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> they're all very nice. And yes, teaching them ethics would be excellent because we should do that. And yes, a bit of design thinking would be really, really good. And yes, a kind of moral code, all excellent, necessary, but not sufficient. And that putting AI into technology and into systems and into the world required a different set of skills than we had in a different set of conversations. And so five years ago, I set about trying to work out how do you build a new branch of engineering in the 21st century? And the answer turns out to be uh, deceptively complicated. <laughs> you have to teach it into existence, research it into existence, and theorize it into existence. And you have to spend a lot of time explaining to people that there are more than just the technologies. It's about all the things that uh, you know, Lily and Victoria and Carl were reflecting. It's about having to have the right conversations and having the widest set of voices in the room. It's about ensuring that you're doing it for reasons that matter, right? That aren't just about making money or making a company. They're about what are the places and systems you want to build. And it's about attempting to understand what are the kind of challenges we have and how do we face them as clear eyedly as we can. So these days I find myself trying to establish that new branch of engineering. I find myself teaching uh, master's students, sadly, so I don't think I can convince any of you to come here just yet, but you should clearly have us on your radar, uh, and trying to work out where are the places that we should have different kinds of conversations. And unfortunately for everyone who I'm looking at on the screen, that also means you know that uh, I'm currently deep in the throes of a project looking at an older historical system, the Overland Telegraph Line, which, in Australia is this hugely important engineering project from 150 years ago that does involve a lot of chemicals. I've right? just been overly waxing lyric about wet cell batteries from the 1800s, which makes me sound like a nutter. Uh, but I'm really interested in what the history of technical systems can teach us about our future. And so for me, thinking about things like the Overland Telegraph Line and 19th century telegraphy and battery technology, as well as things like the Great Exhibition, are ways of asking the question about what is it that we want from and what do we need to know about technical systems as we imagine them in our world. So I'm trying to draw the line from the 19th century and the problems that we had then to the problems that we have in the 21st century. So Marlene, you were talking about the energy transition. I'm thinking a bit about the metaverse as well and wondering what our history can teach us, not because I think it gives us the answers, but because I think it lets us frame smarter questions and to know that we shouldn't be seduced by the story that says every new technology is going to democratize everything and solve everything because it never does. And there's a whole set of ways that we know that older technologies have reproduced and re-instantiated inequities and challenges that we just need to be much more mindful of. So those things, you know, small problems, build a new branch of engineering, <laughs> save the world, work out how to get coffee, you know, to my office, small problems, big problems, but that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Genevieve. We really enjoyed that. And again, you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to have a few very interesting questions from the speakers so far. So uh, now I'd, I'd like to welcome Tom Burke uh, uh, to this uh, very interesting uh, discussion. Co-founding, Tom's co-founding director and chairman of E3G and chairs its board. 
He's also the chairman of the China Dialogue Trust, which produces a number of online productions covering China and the environment. He's the trustee of Climate Advisors UK and other civil society organizations, and a visiting professor at both Imperial and University Colleges London. Tom was the executive director of Friends of Earth in the late 70s of the, uh, of the Green Alliance for most of the 80s, and was a special advisor to three secretaries of state for the environment uh, during the 90s. He's been a senior advisor for a number of major companies, including Rio Tinto, BP, and Stand Standard Chartered Bank. He's also ser served as an advisory in the UK Deputy Premier uh, Prime Minister's Office and the Foreign Office. He was a member of the Council of English Nature, Britain's biodiversity regulator from 1999 to 2005. Uh, Tom has a long track record of experience with international environmental organizations, working with and for both non-governmental and official bodies. So welcome, uh, Tom. Uh, and I might say that based in, in London, I think, uh, based in the UK anyway, uh, to this very interesting discussion. I think you're on mute. Usually undisciplined, and so normally don't mute. So um, it's always slightly disconcerting when you're introduced by somebody reading out your obituary. <laughs> sort of uh, uh, it's all in the past, um, and it's also a particularly sort of cruel and unusual punishment to uh, ask me to sort of respond, having presented me with a panel with such interesting contributions from from all of the panelists uh, and to ask me to do that in five minutes given the amount the, the really brilliant presentations we had from all of them but let me let me see if i can a bit and and, and in the process throw out one or two challenges uh Marlon, you you and i think reminded us right at the beginning and and generally have sort of echoed that a bit it's not by technology alone that you solve problems. Um, you also reminded us something that we don't think a lot about. Um, you set the, the sort of challenge as being a challenge between the incumbents and the innovators. And, and that says there's a whole power dimension to what this incumbents have power and innovators have less power. And we're less good in analyzing why the power relationships about why things don't happen. We can analyze the arguments very well, the policy prescriptions, but we're less good at understanding what the obstacles simply from the power of incumbency. And Kyle have made a very important point about the nature of public discourse and the importance of politics and political discourse in this. A lot of political discourse is about power. Um, sometimes it's about power in a quite a obvious fashion, Sometimes it's about power in quite a coded fashion. And if what you're trying to do is make things better, you really do need to understand how that sort of discourse works and why it has the effect it does, which picks up a point I think that was very important that Lily made that struck me very strongly, which was to emphasize the importance of constant learning. And I think that's completely true. Now, the danger for all professionals, and that includes engineers, is when you think about constant learning, you think about constant learning inside the bounds of your profession. And I think really what you were actually driving at was wider than that. It was about constant learning in a much wider frame. And I think you're completely right about the importance of that. One of the reasons engineers don't have as much leverage on the world and outcomes in the world as perhaps they should, is they tend to know less about the rest of the world than they do about engineering. And I think your advice was quite correctly to learn more about the rest of the world so that you're better able to do what Kyle said out of the challenge, and that's communicate uh, better uh, to the world. I was very struck um, by Victoria, uh, by your the focus you made on the circular economy and the role that chemicals are going to play and have to play in doing that. The reason we're in the mess we are, and we are in a mess, and by we, I mean all of civilization are in the mess we are, is that we've tried to run in a closed cycle uh, a linear production system. 
and it simply isn't going to work. And so it's really important to uh, understand that point you've made about the need to start thinking about how do we close all of those, those cycles. But there was a warning, and also, by the way, you, you think you're running on cities, we're what? About three quarters of the world's population are going to live in cities by the middle of this century. So in some senses, that relieves pressure on other uh, bits of the environment, but it isn't half going to mean the demands that those cities make are going to be external to the people living in those cities. So making sure you close that loop in people's minds, part of what one needs to be understanding that wider world. But I was very also struck by you made the point about mycelium, because it, it, it warned me of another risk here, which is um, and all engineers and indeed almost all professionals suffer from, which is hubris, which is thinking you found the answer to all the problems. And the reason I say that is about five years ago, if you talked about mycelium, nobody would have a clue what you were talking about. We were only just beginning to discover what the whole world of fungi means in terms of what it delivers for society. So before one gets heroic about making use of that resource, we need to be reasonably sure that we understand what function it performs in delivering our current services and stuff. So real sort of challenge there for us. But again, uh, and just to, to wrap that, Carl made a big emphasis on the importance of communications. He's absolutely right. But I've got some really bad news for you, Carl. Um, the facts don't matter very much in politics. They don't matter very much in most discourse. And most people don't know the facts uh, and feel pretty uncomfortable about handling the facts. And therefore, when somebody sort of assumes that if all you need to do is keep telling people the facts and sooner or later they'll learn to trust them, I think you're not understanding how facts, the role facts actually play in most people's lives. Uh, they really are important. We're not going to deal with these problems without a society which places a real importance on truth and knowledge. Pretty difficult to see how we're going to do that in the metaverse, by the way, given what we're already seeing and the, and the extent to which social media are beginning to destroy the capacity for truth to influence public discourse. But I think it's quite important to remember that point that your facts and my facts may not be the same facts. And so there's a negotiation about what constitutes knowledge, which engineers need to really understand the importance of. And that's an another thing to bear in mind. There are no facts about the future. If there were facts about the future, we'd be in a lot of trouble. There, is, there are only people's best guesses as to what the future is. So very difficult to use facts to frighten people into doing something much more important to do when I think you were driving out, all of you were driving out really, and that's to look at the opportunity side of this. How do you solve uh, those problems? How do you focus on solutions? And I frankly was deeply encouraged to think that you guys are out there doing your best. Thanks. Uh, thank, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Tom. And I think that uh, tension between innovation and incumbency is, uh, uh, you know, is, is a very important one. And uh, perhaps we can have, hopefully we have some time to explore that some more. Uh, and now uh, it gives me great pleasure to move to Malaysia and uh, Dr. Adiba Kamarulu Saman, Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Professor of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Dr. Adiba Kam Kamarul Zaman has dedicated her career to the prevention, treatment, and research of infectious diseases, HIV AIDS. She's also a strong advocate for HIV prevention, treatment, and care programs in marginalized communities. In 2007, she established the Center of Excellence for Research in AIDS called C Syria, C-E-R-I-A, at the University of Malaya, one of the few dedicated HIV research centers in the region. She has been a Yale-affiliated faculty member uh, since 2012. So welcome to this discussion. The floor is yours. Thank you, Marlene, and I've enjoyed um, all of your presentations as well as uh, the discourse from Genevieve and Tom. So what I think I will um, 
focus on is uh, two things and, and not so much from uh, the HIV world, although um, there's a lot of um, uh, overlap, of course, but what we've learned from um, this current pandemic that we're living in, which is the COVID-19 and how health um, cannot be separated from you know, the, the discipline of engineering. However, I'm sure all of you um, have realized that we all live in silos, right? Um, and, and, and what I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really taught us is, um, at least taught me, uh, two major things. One is, you know, we, we live in this interconnected world and, um, you know, there's environment, there's um, um, the, the uh, animal kingdom, there's plants, there's humans, and we all need each other so much so that um, there's a new discipline for planet, well, not so new now, but it's now coming to the fore um, with COVID, uh, planetary health. Um, and then there's the importance of collaboration. And I, between disciplines, uh, particularly, and even within disciplines, and, and I felt this really acutely, and um, it also played out internationally uh, with respect to how the two worlds, medicine and engineering, are almost like men are from Mars and women are from Venus kind of <laughs> argument. Um, not so much from the chemical engineering discipline, but uh, the, the whole uh, debate around is SARS-CoV-2 um, airborne or is the transmission more a contact transmission? And I think because the two disciplines um, haven't really, you know, come together and, and, and debated this, this issue well together, at least at the global scene, um, that, you know, it's taken a long, long time for um, the medical world to accept what the engineers, um, environmental engineers and others have been saying that, hey, you know, this is probably um, an airborne transmission, much more than it being a contact transmission, with a whole load of uh, repercussions to how we handle um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think moving forward, um, the disciplines, the engineering discipline and the medical discipline need to work much, much more closely together. Um, and it, it probably needs to begin from, um, from uh, the undergraduate um, teachings that, that, that we do. You know, certainly in medicine, we don't sort of even venture um, to uh, teach any aspects of, of engineering. And I think we should, and, and vice versa. In fact, um, at lunchtime, I, I met with an engineer who was sort of giving me a book and, and he was saying, you know, a, a very senior engineer, he said, Adiba, don't you think we, we are very dis different in our disciplines, in the way we think? Um, and I, I think he's right. You know, engineers tend to be very um, systematic and, and medical people <laughs> tend to be, you know, uh, a little bit more vague. Um, uh, and, and, and I think... Um, that you know we we could each enrich each other if if we have more more cross discipline in our teaching so um that would be my number one and and i think genevieve you were saying you did a double degree in um anthropology and something else is that right no no uh well, someone was oh was it you lily who's doing a um sort of combined um uh, degree yeah and i think that would be would be um, very enriching and and secondly um this uh, whole discipline of planetary health you know we, we see how connected the animal world and um, the environment and medicine uh, is you know the, again drawing back on this current pandemic we're living in um how you know we, we still don't know for sure where um, it originated from but Okay, going back to something that we are sure, which is um, another um, zoonotic infection, Nipah virus, which was uh, described in Malaysia, that clearly was uh, had to do with, um, you know, the environment, 
um, the animal kingdom and um, health because uh, the uh, the pig farming industry had moved much, much closer to the caves and the bats ate the fruits which the pigs fed on, which then infected the, you know, this virus that the bats carried, infected the pigs, which then infected human beings. So, you know, the whole interconnectedness um, is, is something that we all need to think more about. and. Um, you know, a, a, there's a discipline of planetary health, but also within the, like I said, within the, coming from, you know, uh, a former dean, I'm actually a former dean, um, thinking how we can infuse uh, the, the best of the um, foundation and the fundamentals of engineering into medicine um, so that we can enrich one another. After all, whether it's medicine or law or engineering the whole purpose and i love what genevieve said the whole purpose is about you know contributing to mankind to make this world a better place so working in silos in our own discipline um you know in this modern world uh, is not going to be very efficient or effective anymore Thank you for thank, having me in this discussion. Thank, thank you very much, Adiba, for, for those uh, uh, those thoughts. And, and we certainly, uh, you know, it's certainly food for thought for us to think about more interdisciplinary um, work that we can do, uh, doctors and engineers and lawyers, and I think perhaps communicators as well, as that's coming through. Um, I, I'm going to now just open the discussion to, to a few questions, and I was going to uh, uh, reflect on uh, a, a common theme that's coming through, uh, which Tom Burke said, there's no facts about the future, and which Genevieve had said in, in the interview that was done in preparation for ChemEnge Evolution, about the fact that uh, the, uh, the approaches that we have today in the 21st century were developed in the 20th century, and that perhaps we need a, a new paradigm to address the problems of the future, uh, you know, where there are unknown unknowns. And um, so I, I'll throw to Genevieve first and I'd say, so how might we uh, address um, or, or, you know, or, or think about uh, these, the global challenges that we face today and perhaps that we face tomorrow that we don't know about the unknown unknowns and what, what would, how would we develop approaches to address these? Well, I think there are two different ways to do this, right? In a couple of projects we've just finished, we've used the idea of speculative futures as a tool for interrogating the future. So rather than imagining the future is set, uh, how do you do two things, right? One is how do you take the work of a delightful futurist by the name of Will Gibson, who back 20 plus years ago said, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed, which is the most delightful provocation because it says, if you go looking, you can find the future right now around you and you can decide, is that the future we actually want or is that something we should accelerate, <laughs> resist, <laughs> amplify? And it requires looking differently around you to see are there glimpses of the future right now? And sometimes they'll look completely bonkers, right? You're like, there is no way that is the future. I have a colleague of mine who took a photo on a train platform in Tokyo in 2003 and the entire train platform is full of people holding phones in their hands, looking down, right? And we took that photo to the vice president of research at my company at the time and said, look, this is Tokyo, 2003, everyone's got a mobile phone and it's a data service and a, you know, location-based services and they're doing location-based shopping and dating, oh my God, and chatting. And the VP looked at me and went, yeah, that's never going to happen. That's just Japan. And I'm like, I'm pretty certain I've seen the future. He's like, you are so wrong. I was like, oh, I think I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember holding this picture up 10 years later and going, this looked familiar. They're like, oh, where did you take that? I'm like, Tokyo. They're like, oh, when? I'm like, 2003. They're like, no way. And so I think part of the way for me about thinking about the future is to be aware that the future is not some destination that we're going to go sort of like arrive at. It's already happening. It's already in play, particularly in many engineering and computing fields. Many of the things that will be here 20 years from now are already in a lab somewhere. Uh, and a lot of the practices that we care about or worry about are already happening somewhere. 
as Adiba reasonably points out, notions of, you know, zoological human interface overleap and the consequences of that are hardly brought to us by the current pandemic. We have had multiple earlier instantiations of what it means to have loss of animal habitat, co-location of humans and animals in zones they weren't supposed to be in, and the consequences of global transportation systems. And, you know, we had SARS 20 years ago to teach us that, and arguably the Spanish flu to teach us that 100 years earlier. So, I mean, there are lessons we can learn from the present to start asking those questions, and there's always that methodology. I think there's the methodology that we also used quite successfully inside large technological organizations, which was to say, we have used science fiction for 100 years to help us think about the futures we do and don't want, and to be able to play out the consequences in a slightly safer, slightly easier to contest way. And then it becomes a how do you tell multiple of those stories simultaneously to work out what are the common threads and what are the other pieces. Uh, and I think both of those are useful things. I think underlying both of them though, there's another set of practices that we need to invest in, which is to have those kind of conversations about possible futures. You need to have, I think a couple of other things. You need to have a clear statement about the world you want to build, as in what's the world you want, what are the values? And you heard, I mean, Lily in particular and Victoria and Carl to talk about what are the kind of values of a world they imagine they'd like to build. So I think you need to be really deliberate about those, right? Technology is never value neutral. So what is the state we want to build and how do we know how to think about that? Problem number one, like, you know, how do you have a point of view about the world you want to build? Then I think you need to have a plurality of voices in the room who have different lived experiences and different agendas and different, not truths, Tom, but at least they come from different places. And then I think you have to be willing to imagine that what those voices are gonna do is generate discord. And I think one of the hardest things I have found as a leader is how you manage organizations through a state of productive discomfort. <laughs> so rather than trying to get to consensus, how do you allow the disagreements to percolate because you actually need that uh, diversity of thinking to generate new ideas and you need those ideas to at least be prickly at the beginning because they're challenging the way the world is, right? So how do you get good at productive discomfort? I think it's a really important state for any organization that wants to be thinking about the future. And then I think the third piece, and maybe Tom and I get to talk about this because we're maybe feeling old in this conversation, uh, is that I think it's hugely important that the ideas you have about the future have a certain kind of grace to them, which I know sounds like a crazy thing to say, but there's a little bit about how do you build an idea with enough form that it will hold through a generation or two and enough room that it allows people to do different things with it. So those are me the kind of the states of an organization that's good at thinking about the future. You know, it, under, it has a point of view, it's good with productive discomfort, it understands that those conversations don't get solved in an afternoon. <laughs> and I think, you know, Tom would agree that if we want to work, imagine conversations here they're going to take days weeks months years and the iterative nature of those means you would have to keep showing up for them and i'm sorry to tell that to you young ones i want to desperately say no it will get solved by 2024 but the answer is it's going to take half of your lifetimes and you're going to have to keep showing up for the conversations with the same degree of enthusiasm you have now which is why you'll need the coffee and then you need to be willing to think about what's the shape of the argument right what's the shape of the idea that's not so intrinsically wed to you that you're the only person that can litigate it, but that it has enough room for other people to do things with it. It's a very long answer. Yes. No, thank you. Thank you uh, for giving us even more food for thought. Tom, uh, did you want to add anything to that? Well, well uh, and then in particular, I might ask, sorry to interrupt, just wanted to, uh, reflecting on what you said in your interview, you, you made a comment about addressing future challenges in terms of the, the diversity and the, the productive dis, the, uh, discomfort that, that Genevieve referred to. You talked about how do we pick up the weak signals from the noise? And I think that's a similar in idea uh, variation from that. So can you comment on, on, on how do we pick up on the future and how do we navigate our way into this great unknown? <laughs> The short answer is I don't have the answer to the question as you framed it, but let me let me put it slightly differently. We've unlocked the secrets of the uh, nucleus of the atom and the secrets of the nucleus of the cell. So we've acquired godlike powers and we haven't acquired godlike capabilities to manage those powers. 
So we now have a much more blunt question, uh, which humanity has not faced before, which is either we make the future we want, or the future will make the life we live. And we have to decide that. Uh, so we have to start in some sense by with some idea, and I don't mean a plan, with some idea. And then we have to think, how do you shape the future? And my reason for my uh, point about facts is just because they're kind of slippery um, and, and people rely over much on them for shaping big choices. Uh, and a lot of the time in public political discourse, the facts are just ammunition that different interest groups pile up to fire at their opponent. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful about the reliance on the fact. And I look at what, what are the tools available? We've got 8 billion tech enhanced people on the world. And the challenge is how do we create a shared, some sort of shared future? Well, you've got three ways in which you can influence the choices people make. You can bribe them, lots of different variations on how you bribe them, but basically you can bribe people to do things. You can coerce them, and we're beginning to see how some of the technology we've discovered that invented that we thought would be very good for us turns out to be much more useful for being really bad for us uh, in terms of enhancing the capabilities for the coercive use of power. Or you can persuade people. Those are the only three tools you basically have to shape the, the future and to shape the choices of people are doing it. And it seems to me the important point about that is then constructing the narratives is as important as identifying the facts, the priorities, and all the systematics. Now, one of the things that was interesting, Jenny Reed, coming from her background, you know, one of the things that you learn from anthropology is the importance of narrative in holding societies together. But we don't spend very much time talking about narrative and the kind of narratives you need to make the future. We tend to focus on that, that sort of apparently more manageable things like the engineering and the facts. But I don't think unless we get the right narratives, we'll be able to make use of all of those extraordinary capabilities that chemical engineers and other engineers are able to make available to us. But we have to have a purpose. So the focus on the moral purpose is completely right. We have to decide what our purpose is and focus on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I might ask Kyle to comment on that because you talked a little bit about communication and, and the narrative and uh, uh, how you think that engineers in particular would shape that narrative going forward. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a tricky question. Um, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't feel like I have any answers coming to me straight away. I think a narrative is definitely something very, very important. Um, and something like if, you know, if we see ourselves in a, a dire situation, then a narrative is something that we can kind of feel safe with if we're given it, like if we're given a path out of this situation, then that's something that makes us feel very nice. But then constructing that is extremely hard when, you know, I certainly don't know the right way out. Um, if I'm, how am I supposed to give someone hope or give someone a narrative? I feel like I only have, you know, 10% of the picture. Um, and so, yeah, maybe Tom could give us some ideas as to how, actually how to build that narrative. Just a thought, Kyle. Um, by narrative, I don't mean a sequence of words that I like the sound of or agree with. By narrative, in this context, I mean a sequence of words that make sense of a set of choices or actions or behaviors. And so if you like an example of somebody doing that brilliantly at the moment, look at Zelensky in Ukraine, constructing a narrative, a very simple narrative about how we're not going to give up a yard of our soil, which makes sense of all the sacrifice that people are making uh, to uh, hold on to Ukraine against the invasion. So there's a particular thing about narrative in this sense. It makes sense of things that you feel or choose or do. Uh, and that, and then so you're looking for a narrative that constructs a pattern of behaviors that adds up to something we can all live with. 
it's not easy. So I'm not surprised that you found it difficult. I don't have a kind of what I can try out and give you. Yeah, no, well, thanks, thanks case, so much, Kyle. Oh, sorry. I guess just just to follow up, I guess I I think um, maybe just having integrity um, and really sticking through with with things um, through every like I guess journey um, over in the US. I think might be able to create a narrative. I mean, he's never got you know become the president or anything, but. He's definitely stuck through. Like every time I see him say something, even if it's 20 years ago, it's always the same thing. And I think maybe integrity and sticking true um, to what you've always said for like your, your values, I think, may help. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Carol. I've got a question here in the box, uh, which I might address to Adiba, uh, which says Is the most exciting time ahead of chemical entity? Yeah ahead of us in chemical engineering if we uh, stop working in silos and work more collaboratively together is that the most exciting part of it yeah is, is well, that the most exciting part it, is, of it? I, don't, I don't think it's the most exciting part of it but certainly i think it probably is an essential uh, part of it um you know in in having Interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary interactions, definitely. I, I think it's happening, obviously, in biomedical en engineering. Um, you know, there's combined classes, etc. But perhaps um, we should be thinking about widening it um, to a broader, uh, to, to the broader discipline of engineering. For instance, um, the presentation on designing um, a new city. You know that the, it, it um, this obviously impacts um, a great deal on um, on public health. Uh, you know, uh, forcing people to walk in, and take public transport instead of having cars. You know how you design cities that encourage people to to walk, which that then becomes a um, a uh, natural exercise. Um, uh, it's, it's just one example, but having that that input into how you design cities from public health from um, would be essential. And and like I said, I think a lot of that at the moment is happening in silos. Yes, no, thank you. And yes, Lily, go ahead, please. Did you have I just have a question on that for Adiva, and that is, do you think it's more valuable to bring sort of a world of opportunities, like you mentioned, I'm doing a double degree to one person, or is it better to connect people who are already really invested in specific areas of their studies together in a more of a like leadership sort of group or academy um, in order to sort of facilitate those interconnections and those deeper understandings? Yeah, you probably need um, both levels, right? Sort of the um, a kind of uh, introductory um, level into uh, you know with with basic concepts into um, the courses, but certainly for more um, uh, uh, deeper and 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 um, extensive discussions and discourse it would need to be at the leadership level. So I think um, having both pathways is going to be essential. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'm going to ask this question from Victoria. Uh, and this is again uh, from the audience. Uh, it says the question is Genevieve talked about uh, speculative futures and challenges and productive discomfort. How can the chemical engineering profession be better in this environment? Yeah, um, with that kind of discomfort, I think kind of going off of what Adiba was saying, you need a whole range of ideas. Um, the problems that we're going to be experiencing in the next, you know, 100 years, they're going to be complex. They're going to not just be pure engineering. They're going to be political. They're going to be um, environmental. They're going to be practical, such as building new cities. Um, and you need civil engineers for building cities. Um, so I think bringing everyone to the table is going to be really important for driving through that discomfort and making sure that everyone gets the chance to put their um, 
knowledge base and their experience forward because you might have someone in the back of the room who has the perfect answer but it might not be exactly the area that their expertise is in um so i think really bringing all of that expertise in together and really having a diverse group to answer those questions problems and um lead through discomfort is going to be very important yeah and I, and I think innovation happens at the boundaries of so many uh areas so again that interdisciplinary approach you know the sum putting it all together might be greater than the individual path because of the synergies so yeah i think that's a great idea there's another question from the audience which i'm going to ask lily to perhaps consider uh, as all three of you addressed this topic in your interviews uh, and it relates to UN Sustainable Development Goals. Can these goals provide a form of grounding philosophy for the discussions we need to have about making the future better or a better world? Uh, and uh, you know, our engineers are deeply in this mix. Yeah, I think that definitely the UN Sustainability Goals are a great place to start. And you notice a few of the big issues that I mentioned in my speech were already things that are covered by the sustainability goals, things like equitable and accessible health, um, access to drinking water, access to food, all those basic human rights that people need, and then how we can facilitate them. And I think it's also just really important to consider the fact that, you know, who developed the UN sustainability goals, obviously the UN, but um, just making sure that when we're trying to apply these concepts to different situations like do we actually consult the people that we're designing for and make sure that these also align with what their priorities are and i think it is a good place to jump off at and for businesses to measure their impact against um, because it is such a universally known framework but it definitely requires more nuance um, depending where it's applied I, I, I might uh, uh, follow that up with a question to Genevieve because uh, I think you had a viewpoint in the, and, and Tom, I'll, I'll come back to you, Tom. In your interview, uh, Genevieve, you talked about the fact that the United Nations and uh, the U UN Sustainable Development Goals came from a particular uh, you know, uh, paradigm where you had certain countries that drove it and led it and if if you know what what sort of paradigm would we have today and are those sustainable development goals are they relevant or should we be looking at something else do you want to comment on that oh only to say that like many things they are a product of a particular moment in time and a particular constellation of interests and expertise and queries right and i'm always acutely aware and negligent in this particular instance uh, that we didn't start this conversation by reflecting where we are. So I might just pause to do that. So right now, at least I am sitting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people here in Canberra, Australia. And I would at the beginning of this call normally have paid my respects to the elders past and present of this place and reflected that I'm on land that was always sacred and never ceded. And I know Lily and Kyle and Victoria are also on Aboriginal country here in Australia and calling the names of those traditional owners and elders of that place is a way at least here in Australia we have started to think about what it means to have a set of ideas about a country that are vested in that place and in the sustainable ideals of that place and for us we're lucky to be in a place where indigenous people have been intersecting with the environment for 60 to 80,000 years and are deeply considered in ways of thinking about sustainability and what that means and so for me at least when I think about how the various human rights conventions over the last 80 years have had to contend with indigenous people, with women, <laughs> with children, uh, with countries that didn't exist when they came into existence and ideas about the human that didn't exist then. I'm always kind of struck by remembering that those objects are really good first drafts. <laughs> like they're really helpful for driving the conversation. But I'm also really acutely aware of the points of view that don't necessarily find their way into the room and the ways we have to keep modifying and adapting and adopting them over time, right? I mean, for a bunch of us on this call, we're acutely aware that, you know, the first set of conversations that happened after the original human rights charters were driven were about where did women sit in those conversations and what did it mean to think about children and Indigenous people? And the same will be true about the current SDGs, right, is that they are 
a good beginning to the conversation, but you wouldn't want them to be the whole conversation. And I am just acutely aware that, you know, for those of us in Australia and indeed in New Zealand, in North America, there are lots of other founding stories of the places that we live in and really different ideas about not imagining the environment as separate and distinct from the human, <laughs> but actually as part of incredibly complex dynamic systems where it's not just about sustainability, but about responsibility and cultural continuities and about ideas of being indivisible and intertwined with those places. And so for me, there's a little bit about wanting to ensure that we can tell and respect and hear different beginnings of those conversations that don't always unfold over the same, I don't know, sort of narrative arc. Yeah, thank you. Tom, you had a comment? Well, just to really, briefly, really following on from that a bit, um, a very, uh, it's an extraordinary accomplishment to have created a forum uh, which now over 40 years has conducted a conversation about how all 8 billion of us are going to live on the planet. Uh, and that really is, it's easy in the frustrations of dealing with the immediate problems to blame the fact that we're not doing better on the institution rather than on the people who the institution is trying to, to govern, as it were. Um, but I just want to remind everybody in these very, very uncertain times that it took the Second World War to get humanity to learn that it needed to do this. And I'm not sure that we'd be in much of a position to repeat the learning exercise if we find ourselves in a third world war. So it's quite important not to, for all our frustration with the slow progress, not to underestimate, to, to, under, you know, to avoid underestimating the importance of having a place where we get down, the whole world does get down and talk about these issues on this one planet that we share. Yes, yes, thank you. Well said. Uh, I have, I probably have time for a, a, at least one more question. So I'll direct this to Victoria. Can we land on engineers as storytellers in order to deliver facts and directions for the non engineering population? Is this a skill that we are missing? Yes, I think we are in some cases. Um, I see this especially when you're in interne interconnected groups of. Um, a variety of different knowledge bases and you have the engineers they have the technical knowledge um, and we're great when we're talking to other engineers but when we're talking to non-engineers sometimes we can get lost in um i guess telling the main theme of what we're trying to get across um so what is the main problem and what is the main solution but how do we do that in a people-centered way um and i guess the same goes for other um disciplines and stuff as well so oftentimes when they're saying things to engineers, it's this whole simplifying stuff down enough that everyone can get the point, but not, you know, simplifying too much. Um, it's a very fine line to balance along. Um, but yeah, I think the more we practice diversity within our groups and um, getting that narrative across, the more it's going to become a key skill. And I think it is something that can start in university, definitely um getting those you know groups of multi different um disciplines of people together and just getting them to talk about real life problems um i think that's definitely a great place to start yeah yeah thank you thanks very much victoria and so the last question which uh, i think we we've, we've had a, a refrain coming through this about uh creating a better world a sense of purpose fairness and justice uh, uh, so uh, the question here in the box is a better, fair, just, sustainable future will need a coherent policy framework that follows the science and influences either bribes, coerces or persuades society to make the right choices individually and collectively. What should ICME, the Institution of Chemical Engineers, do to help deliver this? Uh, I'll open it to the floor. If you want to take that so this is a, something that can we can take forward as uh, as a result of this webinar any thoughts uh, the, go ahead you can go first oh i was just going to briefly mention that i think that when we're developing policy um our leaders 
at the top that we sort of see, especially in the Western world, are not necessarily coming up with the old, all the ideas. Um, they're more actually following the crowd of the people who are voting for them um, and maybe more biased towards the people who have the influence um, in cert certain ways. But I think that sort of draws into question what iChemy can do um, to be a part of this discussion, a part of making policy that's going to influence the future. And that is just having discussions like these and then taking that forward into the world and sort of spreading um, ideas about what the world should look like and what Tom and Genevieve and Adiba have touched on today. Um, I think, yeah, just if we can spread the ideas amongst society and sort of apply these in, put them in businesses um, as we work as chemical engineers or in the various fields that we are in, um, that's how we can actually sort of influence policy and start making change. Thank you. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, there, there is no mistake-free way to address the problems we've been talking about in this session. So we need a society which can learn from its mistakes. And what despots and autocrats do is destroy all those machinery that we put together to learn from our mistakes. So one of the things that IMACI needs to make sure it does is make sure that all of its members and its uh, uh, professional community understand the importance of democracy as a way of making use of the skills that engineers can bring. And that, in a sense, addresses a, a question I think Adiba touched on to some extent, which is what is the nature now in a, in a very highly information rich world of the education, the fundamental education you need for engineers? Does it need to be more focused on the broader context and less on the particular discipline than it's been? Because a lot of that now is much more accessible than it used to be. So there's a real question for IMACE about what is the nature of a really well-prepared chemical engineer of the future to deal with the kind of political policy pressures, economic pressures that they will be subject to as they try to make their skills and talents make a difference in the world. Yes, I think uh, I think you're, you're very right. And that's been coming through, with, through a lot of other work that's been done on engineering education. The so-called soft skills are actually not soft at all. They're the hard skills. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and we need more of those. Adipa, would you like to comment on this? What, what, uh, what would uh, you recommend that ICME should do to address uh, the issue as to how uh, we create a fair, just uh, uh, and coherent policy framework? Sure, I, I think there are already, um, you know, these frameworks, whether it's the SDGs or the ESGs, um, as they're called, um, that all work towards, you know, uh, uh, what we all want, a fair, just um, uh, world and, and society. The, the problem is, I think, sometimes these um, uh, frameworks exist, you know, out there, uh, but it's not really implemented or the information is not disseminated or implemented and certainly not monitored and evaluated how uh, effective they are. So perhaps for an organization like, um, like this is to translate some of those key things uh, and ensure that organizations within it or associated with it, with it network, um, within it um, actually embrace this, these ideas and and frameworks that already exist. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and I don't know, I have some form of accreditation so that people um, start to uh, be serious about it. You know, um, Unfortunately, if, if you don't have some kind of stick, um, sometimes these things just get forgotten or, or not, not done. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you, thank you. Kyle, do you have any comments on this? What should ICME be doing uh, to create a coherent policy framework that follows the science and influences society? Yeah, I, 
can't name too much more than what everyone said. I think everyone's done quite good justice. Um, yeah, I have no more ideas, I'm sorry. All right, okay. Victoria, any uh, any um, further comments? Since you're yeah, only engineer. One. Um, I think I can, we can do a lot with challenging um, the chemical engineering community to get into more not traditionally chemical engineering jobs, um, whether that's policy or governmental roles, technology advances that aren't pure chemical engineering. I think um, it takes a lot of guts to go into those roles when you're not, it's not commonplace. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that means for alchemy, but I definitely think there are some opportunities there for challenging the chemical engineering um, community around the world to really dive into those. Yeah, thank, thank, thanks, Victoria. Genevieve, any uh, any uh, last statements on this point? I think just one, right, which is that it's hugely important not to feel like you are chemical engineers in a world alone, absent other disciplines and absent other preoccupations and skills, right? So there's a little bit about, I mean, for Lily and I, at least, the great joy of my life and I hope of hers will be that we have traversed in between and through and between disciplines. And there is enormous power in that as there is power in having conversations with people who don't live inside your disciplinary heartland. Uh, those are really generative conversations. And I suspect the future of chemical engineering is not its own future, right? It is a future interdependent with and driven by and through what will be happening in lots of other places. And so I think the encouragement is not to just imagine you are solely a chemical engineer, right? You are part of a whole set of conversations, some that you know Tom and Adira and I all care about and others that will become emergent, right? And so there's a little bit about not being so wed to your disciplinary praxis that you can't imagine that there are other places and conversations that you want to be part of. And frankly, other people who want to be part of your conversations too. Yeah, great. Yes, I, I, I agree here, here. So, and um, thank you very much. So we're just a little over, uh, uh, after the hour and a half that we were allocated. So I'm going to have to bring this very uh, interesting discussion to a close, but I think we've explored uh, a, a lot of new ideas and covered a lot of territory. But the, uh, the resounding theme is that uh, chemical engineers do have a lot of work to do to address the challenges that we have today and in the future. And I think uh, uh, we have the skills and uh, the sense of purpose, I think, and for a fair and just and equitable society is very important. We didn't touch on many of the other areas of equity, um, uh, which uh, I think are also quite important in, in an increasing technological world. But clearly, uh, we've got an important job to do that goes beyond technology, which goes beyond the theory and practice of chemical engineering and to engage more with society and uh, in words of one syllable, if you like, and also to learn from other disciplines and incorporate those learnings in our work. So it's a two-way street. I think we've learned a great deal from our uh, eminent speakers here today, but also from our uh, Liberus Academy students. And, and thank you very much for your thoughtful presentations and contributions. It's been a really, very interesting uh, session. Um, and uh, a great contribution to the centenary celebrations of ICME. So thank you all very much. And thank you to the audience for joining us and for your questions. Uh, we'll draw this to a close. Thank you. Thank you.